everybody. Um, my name is Johnny Walker. I'm, um, I'm actually from Australia and I talk pretty quickly and I've been told to get through this in about six or eight minutes, so I will. Um, my, uh, my dad was a country GP. We grew up in, um, in rural New South Wales. Dad had very little technology other than the old um, uh, doctor's bag and the old uh, stethoscope. And um, I had an older brother and, he, and Phil wanted to do medicine and Dad said, Gee, that's a great idea, Phil, off you go. I put my hand and said, Gee, I'd love to do medicine. And Dad said, no, Johnny, that's probably not a good idea. You haven't got the personality for it, they'll break you and what have you, and look, it's a pretty tough gig. And um, I was fortunate enough to kick on and um, somehow got into medicine and then I was um, lucky enough to be able to um, travel and train around the, the world in, in centres of excellence, uh, in, um, not only in Sydney, but in, uh, in London, at the Royal Postgraduate Medical School at the Hammersmith Hospital in London, and then up in Cambridge and across to Stanford before I actually came back by accident um, to do a locum, again by accident, um, high up in the bush in um, Western Australia on the 11th of the 11th of 1995. And you may have just caught a glimpse of it there, but my first five patients actually um, were, were these ladies. And um, yeah, they were one of um, some 48 ladies, all Aboriginal, all female, all pregnant a significant number of them were diabetic. And the problems with diabetic mums is that the sugar goes across the placenta, the bub sucks up the, um, the sugar, and the baby becomes quite large. And when mum goes to deliver the baby, um, both mum and bub die um, during that stage of um, delivery. And so it's an, it's an enormous problem that they have. And it was that particular night, um, after I'd done all of these scans, that I just felt there was this huge divergence between the quality of care that I'd been blessed to um, have in centres of excellence where I'd trained around mm. the world, and the care that was actually being provided to these people in regional, rural, remote Western Australia. And I just thought there had to be a better way. And I'd seen some technology when I was at the Hammersmith um, um, that would obviate uh, the only solution we had available to us at the time was, if in doubt, fly it out. And the Royal Flying Doctor Service, it's a fantastic service, um, but it's a not-for-profit. It relies very much on the generosity of, um, of uh, benevolent people who, who help keep it afloat. But about 11% of retrievals are for obstetric crisis. And, um, and this particular day when I was out there, I got uh, an obstetric crisis. I got a, a baby that um, didn't develop into a normal baby. It developed into what we call a highly deformed molar pregnancy, where all the ingredients of the normal bub are there, but it becomes hideously intertwined and becomes actually this very, very um, rapidly growing large, um, highly vascular and tumorous mass and has the ability to metastasize around the, bo the body and mum in fact perishes. The only treatment we had in those days was to do a hysterectomy. And so um, indeed that day we did have to fly mum out, in fact two mums that night. And it was that night that I just thought there's got to be a better way of delivering health care. And so um, I basically built by accident, kind of, um, a little thing called a teleradiology or a telemedicine network, linking these small communities of Harvey, Collie, Donabur, Bridgetown, Management, Margaret River, and then, um, and then transmitting these uh, images over in those days, just a little old 3K telephone line, um, the old copper wire. Um, and whilst it was slow, it actually worked. Um, so we could send a, a little X-ray from, from one point to another point, and it worked. Now, as it turned out later, I didn't know it actually wasn't legal for me to be doing that, but we, um, bit by bit by bit by bit, we built this practice which started to cover an ever-growing area of this huge um, area, so some two and a half million square kilometres. She's a, she's a big old paddock, Western Australia. And then from there, we were able to, in a very... Over the next 10, 15, 18 years, we were able to grow that into an international network, into the United Kingdom by invitation, here into Ireland by invitation. And um, now we, um, we take um, a, a significant number of patients' images around the clock around the world and we transmit them for a web-based service around the clock to a panel of radiologists who are awake and alert using high-resolution monitors and voice-activated dictation to actually transcribe the report and then take the key images and then transmit them straight back onto the referring doctor's desktop or to their mobile device. And um, we do that a significant number, many thousands of times a day. Um, it comes to a point where the, the, the founding entrepreneur is, is probably not the person to go on and scale it. And um, so I chose uh, to, um, uh, to move on from the practice uh, and... My real worry was that the ecosystem that I live in every day, and I'm, I'm, I'm in the belly of the acute care hospital, that box over there on the right, I just think that it's so chaotic and there's so much vested interest in keeping it chaotic that there has to be a better way of delivering health care and, um, and try and move that health care out, um, out of the acute care setting. And you might ask, well, Johnny, what, you know, what's the big problem with the way we deliver health care at the moment? The big problem is, you know, it's a hospital-based um, uh, um, model, isn't it, Austin? It's a doctor-focused model, right? And I don't believe that's, um, that's the most effective and efficient way to deliver healthcare. And you've got to ask yourself, you know, where's the patient in all of this? 
well, in the vast majority of times, the patient's in the car trying to get to the hospital, trying to find a, um, a car park. And then when the patient does get into our room, you know, we talk in supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, teres minor. You know, that's just the rotator cuff. We talk in a language which is completely foreign. We talk, you know, often through the patient, around the patient. They feel like they're in this overcrowded waiting room and on this, in this perpetual um, sort of conveyor belt of care to get looked after. And so it, it isn't really, really, truly patient-centric. And I think there's a better way of, um, of uh, being able to deliver that. And one of the solutions is to try and stop them coming into the acute care setting to begin with and then move them into the, um, in the community. And within the community, I think there's one other big step we need to do, and that is to go into the home. And then within, when we get into the home, now we have these compelling technologies that allow us to do this, then I think there's all sorts of stuff, all this really, really positive disruption we can bring about to the way we actually deliver healthcare to these people. So how might we do that? Then one of the solutions is to really try and start harnessing these little guys um, and, uh, and not let the technology sort of drive us, but be, take control of them and use the technology where it's appropriate to actually bring around really, really meaningful and, and measurable and, 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 and sustainable quality care um, to people who would otherwise not have had it in communities around the world and even in communities such as the one we live in here, deliver it in a way which is far faster, better, safer, more effective and efficient if we deliver it from the home. Okay, so that's um, my big punt. I believe that we can actually use the technology to build um, electronic health records, for instance, in the, in the shape of a, of a family tree where every single member of the family has their own branch, including the dog, and we'll have um, now with wearable sensors and the various technologies we have available to us, we can actually acquire a lot of the biometric data in an instant, whether it's blood sugar level or blood pressure or pulse rate or respiratory rate or renal function. We can get a lot of that now through sensors which actually don't even have to penetrate the skin and we can beam them onto a platform which will then open it up to all members of the, um, the healthcare ecosystem. And one of my observations is that of all the patients that I operate on, everyone has to have a carer with them. And in 92% of cases, the gender of that carer is female. Not necessarily the mother, but it's the female within that family unit. And I think the female, and I know I'm going to get shot down for this, but it's the female who is the real first synapse, in 92% of cases at least, to actually engage in the healthcare system. And that's the female that we should be focusing on and really engaging and empowering. Okay, so that's my big punt, um, and, uh, and really placing the female at the centre of her ecosystem. And if we can do that, if we can stop patients coming into hospital, keep them well in the community, keep them in the, um, well in the community within their home and engage them in this way, then what we do is we end up simplifying that chaos that you saw on that earlier slide on, the, on my drawn page. The, the real gatekeeper, um, the real custodian, the real disruptor of healthcare um, is engaged, braced and powered and educated in a, in a non-patronising way. For everybody she loves, all the way from conception through all of life's milestones to that dignified ageing to that really important last phase of quality of life to end of life all of that, while still being able to engage all members of her ecosystem 24-7, all from the sanctity of her own home. Okay, so I think we need to look, we need to listen, design, disrupt in a really positive way, and but a bold way, in a courageous way, and to transform, not with one big hit, but bit by bit by bit by bit, the way we deliver healthcare. And, um, and I think there's never been a more compelling time. I don't think we've ever been more empowered to do it. And um, I think the onus is on us now to go out and make it happen. So thanks, guys. Thank you very much. God bless you.